Well, good morning, church, and welcome to Alive Fellowship Church. You know, we've been talking over the last couple weeks about uncovering God's will, and we said that the good news is God has a will for our lives, and He wants us to know it, probably in most cases, more than we want to know it. Now, we started off by talking about the fact that there are a couple things, kind of a couple guardrails that uh, God has set up in place to help us. One is his providential will and the, the other one his moral will, the providential will, the things he's going to do no matter what. And then God's moral will, these are the things that he requires of all of us, the things that we already know. And then somewhere in between there, we're going to uncover uh, his personal will for our lives. And we said last week that one of the primary tools that he will use to help us to discover his will for our lives are other people, other believers, people who might know better than us about a certain situation. And we talked about how important it is to seek counsel and to, and to ask a, a questions. Now, I understand that many people are brand new Christians and maybe they're just now starting to walk with the Lord, uh, and you find yourself needing to make a decision, and, and you're learning the providential will, and you're learning the moral will, but what happens when you're kind of like in a time crunch? You, you have an opportunity, or you need to know something very, very soon. So we need to know that we can ask God to bring someone into our lives to help us to speak to us. Then there's another tool that God will use to help guide us and discover us and uh, to discover uh, His will for our lives. The other primary tool that God will use to guide and direct us uh, is His Word, the Bible. Now, <clears throat> here's the problem. Unfortunately, many times the Bible is misused. There is a tendency to overlook it as a primary tool in trying to help us discover God's will for our lives. So what I want to do this morning is I want to talk about, for a few moments, uh, that particular aspect. And so here's the question. How does God, how does God speak to us through the Bible? H how are we to use the Bible to determine and to figure out God's will for our lives? Now, King David certainly understood this. He, uh, he mentioned it many, many times uh, in the Bible. In Psalms 119, verse 15, it says this, I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. Verse 16, I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. And then slide down to verse 47 and 77, how I delight in your commands, how I love them. Sur surround me with your tender mercies so I may live, for your instructions are my delight. So there are words there like commands, decrees, instructions. These are all principles from God's Word. In other words, David said, when I need counsel, when I need direction, I go to God's Word. And so if we were to look at the Bible that David had, it would simply be just a slice of what we have today. And yet David, through the through the law and the teachings of Moses, found comfort and direction in God's Word. So, in the same way, we are to use God's Word to find direction for our lives and comfort uh, in our lives. So then the question then becomes, how do we do that? Again, we talked about God's moral will and God's providential will. But I want to give you something else that will kind of... <clears throat> help clear the fog of discovering God's will for our lives. And so I want to look at some verses today as, as they relate to making decisions. Now, why is it so important to read and study the Bible when trying to discover God's will uh, for my life? Why is that so important? Well, well, here's why. In the book of Isaiah, we get a great picture as to why we need to study and read God's Word for direction. Here is why. The Bible says this in Isaiah 55, 8. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. And then in verse 9, For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So in, in other words, God is saying, we don't think alike. God thinks a certain way. God sees things a certain way. And we see things a different way. And we think a different way. And so God says right up front, hey, listen, we don't think alike. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. 
And the way that we would normally think or the, the way that we would normally do something might not be the way that God would do it. The way that we would normally respond in a circumstance might not be the way that God would respond. The way we would maybe handle ourselves in the area of finances or family might not be the way that God would want us to handle it. So what might come natural to you and I, what... Uh, what even seems logical to you and I might not be God's way at all. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. And, and now watch, this is key. God says, before you start making decisions, uh, b b before you even entertain asking the question, God, what is your will for my life? If we understand that right up front, we don't always think alike. We certainly don't always act alike, act alike. And that is why we need the Bible and the role that it plays in our lives. Because we don't, we don't have God's mind. And the implication is this. <clears throat> when it comes to making decisions, when it comes to discovering God's will for our lives, in those situations where we're trying to use maybe our own reasoning, power, and logic. When it comes to discerning God's will, our logic from God's perspective may be completely illogical. And so when we're trying to decide something, especially when it relates to relationships, our heart is telling us something and our heart is leading us in this direction, but it may be that that's not the direction that God would have us to go. We can't necessarily always trust our hearts or our ability to reason or intuition. I mean, think about it this way. Whenever you're trying to decide something, there are really kind of three things that come into play or that come to bear uh, or can be applied to the decision-making process. One is the context, the context in which we are making the decision. And two, it's, it's our perspective. And three, it's the outcome. You see, every time we make a decision, we have some sort of context usually, uh, and usually our context is limited to what we know and what we've experienced. And so right off the bat, there's a limitation. Now, why is there a limitation? It, it's simple, because we don't know everything. We don't see everything. We've not experienced everything, and we certainly don't have all the answers. In terms of perspective, any decision we're trying to make is always impacted by our desires, right? Our desires because I really want something. Uh, I'm thinking about trying to figure out what to do over here, but because I really want it, then I go and do it. And so it's impacted by our desires. It could also be impacted by our fears. Well, I don't know what's going to happen. Our desires and fears always impact our perspective on the decisions that we make. Now, in terms of outcome, oftentimes for you and I, uh, it's, it's just a guess. Well, it, I, I think this will happen if I do it this way. I think if I do it this way, this will happen. But the truth is, we really don't know. But what if, what if we had some context, a perspective, a glimpse of, of possible outcomes from God's point of view? Now, now this is huge. Think with me, church. If we had a glimpse of God's context, God's perspective, and God's outcome, if we had that advantage, it would be very difficult to, uh, for us to make wrong decisions. And the key thing is, is we do have that. In the Bible, God has given us a slice of his thinking. That's why it's so important to understand right up front that, that our thoughts are not his thoughts. It's why we've got to get into his, word, into his Word. In the Bible, God has given us a piece of His mind. And in fact, He has given us more in the Bible than we will ever be able to comprehend in a lifetime. When God gave us the Bible, you know what He did? When God gave us the Bible, do you know what He did? And, and this is very important, so get this. When God gave us the Bible, God invited us to look into his thoughts, look into his ways, and become so familiar with his thoughts and his ways that over time, our thoughts and our ways begin to mirror his. It's why we have the Bible. So that our thoughts and our ways and our life and what we do and what we think, it will begin to mirror him. And in doing so, we will learn to discern 
and sort out God's will for our lives. God, our Heavenly Father, has invited us into His thoughts and his ways. And he says, look, I, I don't want this to be a mystery to you. I don't want you to have to get all, of low, get all alone and say, God, you know what? I don't know what to do here, but the next thing that pops into my mind is going to be your will for my life. So the next thing that pops into my mind is Pop-Tarts. Oh, God must want, uh, must want me to be a chef. The next thing that pops into my mind is spare tire. Oh, God must want me to be a NASCAR driver. No, God's going, no, no, no. Where did you get that? Look, God created communication. He is the greatest communicator in the universe. And through the Bible, God is giving us, I mean, think about it. Through the Bible, God is giving us an opportunity. By giving us the Bible, God is saying, I want you to look into what is in my mind my heart and become so familiar with my thoughts and so familiar with my ways and as you and I are become as we become familiar with our uh, with his thoughts and ways we our lives will begin to mirror his our thoughts will begin to mirror his thoughts we will become more like him and we will be able to figure some things out you know I was thinking about this. As an adult, have you ever been in a situation where you're trying to make a decision about something and you think of someone that you have a lot of respect for? Maybe it's a, it's a mom or a dad. Maybe it's a former friend or a boss or something like that. But you find yourself saying, I wonder what so-and-so would do in this situation. I mean, when you think about that, sometimes this light comes on and then all of a sudden you know exactly what to do. Why? Well, because we know their ways. We know what they would have done. And so some of us have taken our greatest cues in decision making from people that we know because we respect them, we love them, and we know their ways. And God is saying, I want that to be the same with me. I, I want... I want you to be able to say, not, not, just because, not just because it's on a bracelet, what would Jesus do, but because you mean it. What would my Father in heaven do? Church, listen. The Bible is given to us for that, ris- that reason. It's so much more personal than just knowing God's moral and providential will. Yes, we have God's providential will. We got his moral will, the things he's going to do, the things he's already told us to do. And in between those two, we will find our personal will. And as we talked about last week, some of that picture, some of that fog is cleared up when we talk to other believers. We we find counsel with somebody. And then also some of that picture is cleared up as we get into God's word. Now watch. Here's how the Apostle Paul said the very same thing in the New Testament, Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. If we're going to change the way we think, if we're going to see things God's way, then we've got to get in His Word. The Apostle Paul says that if you will begin renewing your mind, then you will be able to discern. You'll be able to figure it out. You'll be able to look through all the options that come up and be able to find the best answer. And we will be able to discover God's will, His good and pleasing, perfect perfect will. You see, the truth is, with the Bible, God has put the ball in our court. We have an opportunity. We have really the honor and the privilege to renew our minds, renew our thinking, so that we will be more like Him. And we will begin to see things as God sees them. It's easier. It's easier for us to know what to do in, in, where, in, in the direction that God would want us to go when we are knowing more about Him. You see, the problem with the Bible, the problem with any book, is it must be opened and read if we're going to draw joy from it, learn from it, or apply it. God has given us his word so that we can think as he thinks, understand as he understands, and see as he sees. Why? Because his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Now, most people will tell you there are three big areas of life 
that this all comes into play. Relationships, finances, and health. And we see relationships one way, and God might be on the other side seeing them a different way, and it may, may, may not make sense to us, and that's because our thoughts are not His thoughts, and our ways are not His ways. But, but if I'm God, God's going, look, I created this thing, so trust me for the outcome in your relationships. Same thing about finances. We look at our finances and, and we re read what Scripture says, and there's a challenge there, right? Of course there is a challenge because our ways are not His, His ways. And as we begin to ask the question, God, what is your will for my life? We have to create this category, and this is what I want you to get today. We have to create this category that says, God, I know your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. In our thinking and in our praying, we must begin the decision-making process understanding that God and us think differently. And that is why we have to get into His mind. We have to get into His ways. We have to get into His Word. And the Bible will help us discover God's will for our lives. It all begins with you and I reading and studying the Bible. Now, why do we need to read and study the Bible? Why is that important? Well, in Scripture, we kind of see some things as to why it's important. The first one is uh, we read and study God's Word to grow stronger. I mean, 1 Peter 2, 2, like newborn babes, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow. 1 Corinthians 3, dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would uh, to spiritual people. I had to talk to you as you belong to this world or as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food because you weren't ready for anything stronger. So, so Paul said, I have to feed you, which tells me that, ba that Paul believed in teaching the Word of God. So Paul talks about feeding us milk and meat. So what is the difference between these two? The Bible is not divided. Hey, here's the milk part and here's the, the meat part of the Bible. The difference is how deep we go in any one subject. Listen, growth is necessary if we're going to uncover God's will for our lives. Why do we need to study the Bible? so that we will grow stronger and deeper in our relationship with God. And there's a second reason that we need to, to read and study the Bible, and that is, to, uh, th that is this, to defeat sin. To defeat Satan, you and I must get into his word. Nothing else is going to work. In Paul's letter to the church of uh, Ephesus concerning Christian warfare, he said this, and you guys all know this in Ephesians 6, 17, <clears throat> Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Psalms 119.9, how can a young person stay pure? By obeying your Word. In, in verse 11, I have hidden your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The more Scripture we learn, the harder it is to sin. Why do we need to study the Bible? To grow stronger, to defeat sin. And then number three, to prepare to serve Him. To, to prepare for service. Listen, to serve God properly, we must know how to serve Him. Otherwise, we're just going to make a mess of things. And how do we know uh, how to serve Him? It's in His Word. 1 Timothy 4, 6. If you explain these things to brothers and sisters, Timothy, you will be, uh, worthy, uh, you will be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus. So if you're trying to undercover, uncover God's will for your life, in the area of serving and service, we must understand that that will depend on us reading and studying God's Word. Fourth reason we need to read and study the Bible is to be blessed. Life is filled with so many ups and downs. But I have found in my life, the more I read, the more I study God's Word, the less I am affected by the circumstances of life, and the happier I am. Psalms chapter 1, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join with the mockers. Now watch, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. You see, we study the Bible to help us grow, to defeat sin, to, to be prepared to serve Him, to be blessed. And then number five, we study and read the Bible so that we can 
help other people. Uh, not only will you be able to find direction and wisdom and help for yourself, but you won't be able to help others discover their will or a direction they need to go without God's Word. I mean, look at this verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. You have heard me teach uh, things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now look what it says. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Now you remember last week we talked about going to someone uh, for, uh, for help. Going to someone godly for counsel or for help. What if someone came to you? What if someone came to you trying to seek God's will for their life, or maybe they're looking for some wisdom, for some direction? The second Timothy is, is for you. The, the, that we have been taught these things so that we would be a reliable witness so that we can now teach them to other people. And as we begin to read the Bible, we have got to move beyond just just pulling it out and reading it normally. I mean, many of us read the Bible in, in sort of a touchy-feely way. We kind of go, oh, I love that. Uh, I'm going to put that on a coffee cup. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That is awesome. But I want to challenge you today. I want to challenge all of us today to begin to read the Bible and also look for principles while we're reading it. Do you know what a principle is? A principle is an unchangeable truth. A, a principle is the way that God operates. A, a principle is the way God has put things together. They are timeless truths. Throughout the Bible, there are principles. Well, Pastor Wendell, what is the difference between a principle and a command? I think that's a great question. The difference between a principle and a command is this. A command says, do this. Or a command says, don't do that. A principle says, let me tell you what's going to happen if you do this. Or let me tell you what's going to happen if you don't do that. So they are different. You, you break commands and you can disobey commands, but you don't. Now watch, you don't disobey a principle. The principles are always in effect, just like the law of gravity. It is a principle. Gravity works whether you know about it or you don't. Gravity works if you believe in it or if you don't believe in it. If you quit believing in gravity, nothing's going to happen to gravity. Gravity, it is right there. It has nothing to do with what you and I believe. So the challenge for us is, as we open the book, as we open God's Word to help us narrow and see God's will. We have God's providential, we have His moral will. We have other people seeking counsel that would help clear up the picture, clear up the fog, and we also have God's Word to help clear up the fog. And the challenge for us as we open the book is to ask the question, God, I want to know your ways. I want to know your thoughts. Uh, I'm learning your commands, but will you show me principles? So what I want to do in our remaining time, just a few moments, I want, to, I want to show you some principles to give you an example of how you look at God's Word and you look for principles. Uh, here's the first one. You reap what you sow. That is a principle. Galatians 6, 7. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. In other words, whatever you put into something, you can expect to get something similar out. You reap what you sow. Now, maybe you're not a Christian and you think, well, I knew that. I knew that completely. I don't need to know the Bible to know that you reap what you sow. Well, where do you think it came from? It's a principle. Here's another principle. The people you spend time with will impact you. It's another principle from the book of Proverbs 13.20. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and, and get in trouble. That's a principle. The people you spend most of your time with will impact you. And if you want to change your life, you might have to change who you're spending time with. It's a principle. Here's another one. The way you raise your children will impact them. It will impact them. Proverbs 22, 6. Direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. 
That is a principle. The way you raise your children will impact what they are like when they are adults. It's a principle. Here's another one. Live life with unconditional love. It's a principle. There, there is no statement in the Bible that says this is the principle of unconditional love. But as you read the Bible, it clearly is a principle. And the principle is this. Unconditional love is the most powerful force on the human soul. Nothing leverages change at the level of unconditional love. Colossians 3.14, above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds, binds us all together in perfect harmony. Where there is hurt, where there is rejection, where there is sorrow, uh, massive doses of unconditional, unconditional love have the power to change and reshape the human soul. It is a truth. When you think about it, if you have kids that are maybe like, kind of like in some stuff they shouldn't be, they've got some relationships going on, they're just in a place and you're kind of going, what do I do? Uh, I would ask this, do you want their bodies to come home or do you want their hearts to come home? We want their hearts to come home, don't we? And there is only one solution. It's unconditional love. It's a principle. It is the way God makes uh, made us uh, to work. There are things that you can do to manipulate, to get your kids home, to get them out of those things. But if you want their hearts to come home, if you want their hearts to change, it's going to come from unconditional love. There is no exception. It's a principle. It's the way of God. It's through unconditional love. Now, there are so many other things that, that we could talk about, and they would take us a lifetime to go through. Uh, the principle of how purity leads to intimacy. If you are pure on the front end of your dating life and pure in your relationships, you have a greater capacity for intimacy later. It's a powerful principle. The principle of submitting to authority. Jesus illustrated that. Our willingness to submit. It's a principle. It's how and the way God works. Now, church, watch. The more familiar we become with the principles of God's Word, the easier it is to discern and figure out God's will for our lives. And listen very carefully as I close. Every single decision you make, every single decision that you make in some capacity is going to cross with a principle from the Bible. And the more familiar we are with His ways, with the ways of God, the easier it is to discern the will of God when it comes to making decisions. So that means we've got to read the Bible differently. Begin understanding the necessity of studying God's Word and begin to look for principles. When we do that, here's what will happen. It will allow us to see through the fog. It will allow us to see through our at times twisted perspective, and it will allow us to clear away some of the noise. It will allow us to become more familiar with God every day of your life. Every day of our life, we are making decisions that intersect with the principles of God, the ways of God. And the wisest thing we can do in discerning God's will is to immerse ourselves into His book. Remember, you have God's providential will, you have His moral will, and we're going to always operate between those two. And what helps clear the fog in there are seeking counsel from other people that have been there, have done that. They know more than us about a certain subject. They have some wisdom. They have some advice. We've talked about that. Also in those two is a, a, some, some fog-clearing stuff, and it's all found in God's Word. So as we read and study God's Word, it will clear some of that up. And I hope and pray that you and I would operate between His providential and moral will. We will seek counsel to help clear it up so that we can uh, see God's ways, and we will go to God's Word so that our ways and our thoughts will mirror His. Hey, we want to thank you so much for joining us uh, today. We want you to know that we love you. And church, thank you for being a part of our church. Thank you for giving to our church. Thank you for praying for us. And we look forward to when you come see us real soon. God bless you all. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week.